some of the concepts, um, especially this Poincaré map of a um, associated to a to a periodic solution in a plan in the plane. Um, let's see, there was one thing that I was um, owe you from last time. And also, I'll, I'll talk about the, the exam, the solutions to the exam, um, hopefully. So let's, let's recall, if you have a planar system like this, and you have a periodic, and you know a periodic solution exists, then there is this um, question of whether is this solution stable or asymptotically stable or um, so let me, let me introduce this uh, a periodic solution gamma is orbitary, orbitally stable if um, nearby solutions converge to <clears throat> uh, to uh, a gamma in the following sense. So there exists a neighborhood U of gamma of of, uh, of gamma, right? Such that um, <clears throat> for all x initial conditions in this neighborhood, the distance from the uh, solution starting at x naught, so that's phi of t and x naught, and gamma <clears throat> approaches zero as t goes to infinity. Okay, so we're talking about distance. What's the distance from a point to a set? What's, what's the, what would be the distance from this point to this set? Basically be the minimum of the, well, would be the distance from x naught to the closest point on gamma, right? So, if you have a bounded solution like this, then you always have a minimum. Okay? You may have more than one minimum, but you always have a minimum distance. So, if you, when you take, when you look at the solution starting at x naught, this distance should always be, I mean, should be approaching zero. Now it's not very clear uh, at this point that sort of the shadow of that initial condition on the on the limit set. If I follow the, now the shadow here, so I call this shadow being the closest point to x naught, right? If I follow that, that that's going to stay the same. In fact. I don't think that's necessarily the case, um, right? In other words, at a later time, the point where the solution is, x, uh, where the solution starting at x naught is, and the point where the solution is starting at this point, those are not necessarily going to be closest to each other, right? You see, because I mean, it's a nonlinear system. So, so after time t, they won't be. They won't be the closest. They want I mean, this point is is not necessarily going to be the closest. Maybe there's going to be some other point that's closer, right? So it's not guaranteed. In fact, I mean, you can cook up, cook up examples where this is certainly not the case, right? But here we're not saying that that the, the, the shadows has to be the the one. It's just the distance 
has to go to zero. Right? So just it's approaching the, the trajectory. Okay. Um, so that's arbitrary stable, and and certainly this is what you would think of, and also from the inside. So a neighborhood means both inside and outside points. Well, in the neighborhood, so it has to be a neighborhood. So it has to be some sort of a region here. You know, in this whole neighborhood, this would be the neighborhood U, right? Any point in there has to approach this um, limit cycle, basically. Okay, then it's asymptotically stable. And um, we said that in terms of the Poincaré map, that's related to, so if I have, so given um, given um, any local section at some point y on this. So remember that's perpendicular to the direction. Then we have the P is the Poincaré map. And what we said is that the, Poincaré, the derivative at the point, I mean, let's put it at y, but whether it's less than 1, uh, if it's less than 1 in absolute value, this implies that you have asymptotically stable or, or um, arbitrarily stable. Typically, use asymptotically stable for for an equilibrium, and arbitrarily stable for for a um, for a periodic solution. Right. So, if this quantity is less than one, then uh, then you have orbital stability. And simply, that's saying that if I start at a point here. And then I follow the uh, trajectory. The next time it's it's uh, coming, it's hitting the local section is at a at a point closer to y not to to y. Okay. Does everybody remember that? So this is x one, and this is x this is x not, and this is x one. Now this doesn't really. Sorry, this is supposed to be this way. So it's coming in. It's going out at a dis at a, at a farther point than it's coming in, right? So what I said last time is that there is a formula for the derivative of this Poincaré map, even though the Poincaré, I mean the Poincaré map itself cannot be computed always. I mean it's depending on on that um, point where it's, where, it's, where the local section is is taken, but the derivative is um, can be always. Um, is always equal to the exponential of an integral. Uh, what was the integral? Integral was from zero to. Let's see. Does anybody remember that formula? Oh, okay, to the. So it's basically an integral along this periodic solution. So it has a, some period t. And this is the divergence, right? So this is the integral of the divergence. So df dx plus dg dy 
along the curve, right? So this is gamma at t, let's say, and y. So we start t equals 0 here, and we end up with t equals capital T here. So, so So how can we use this? Did, I, did we talk about this last time? How do we use this thing? So let me make sure. Or no? Okay, I started, I started to show you how... Okay, no, I didn't actually give an example, but I started showing how, the, uh, how, to, make, how to make the connection between the, Poincare, the derivative of the Poincare map and this exponential of the integral of the trace, right? And I said that that's the same as the determinant of, of a metric solution. The metric solution is basically solves the... Um, the variational equation, right? So you take you take the uh, you take the linearization around each point. That's going to be a matrix. That's going to be time dependent, okay? And then you look at basically how an initial solution evolves according to this. Excuse me, an, an initial matrix or vector evolves along the curve, right? So that's kind of computing the variation of that um, along that curve of, of the dynamical system. Okay. So if you take this determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix, why do you get the same thing as the as the derivative of the Poincare map? Anybody thought about that? So let me just mm -hmm. Well, that's not a definition. That's it was yeah. Right. But I guess how do you make the connection with the Poincare map? I'm I'm not expecting that <laughs> that you guys uh will, will, will know because I mean it's it's not very obvious it's not obvious at all. I mean why this determinant of of this metric solution um be exactly the derivative of the Poincaré map, but so the, the, this this piece was something that we actually it was a homework that we kind of scaled it down, but then I gave you the proof for the whole thing uh, and involved a lot of linear algebra. Okay, so this this is this is this connection is kind of uh, true in general. It doesn't have to be a periodic solution or anything. It just has to be a linearization around the curve x of t. Okay. Um, so, right. Well, they're equal. I'm saying, how do you make this equal to? Because we want. What I claim is that this is also equal to the derivative of the Poincaré map in our context when you have a periodic solution and so forth. But so, what? How can you make this relation between this and and the derivative of the Poincaré map? That's that's, the, that's not 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 clear uh, at all. So 
Um, so that's that's the one thing that I want to show uh, really quick, and also I want to sh show an example of how do you use this this relation to kind of um, get the stability of a, of a, of a periodic solution. Uh, okay, so so first let me let me just say um, why this is the same as the derivative of the Poincaré map. So so let x tilde be a two by two metric solution of of this of the linearization around the periodic solution. And and this is really supposed to be gamma. Okay. So what does this what does this mean? This means that if I have I'm just going to take a portion of gamma to remind you that variational. So this is the variational 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 equation. It says if I have a vector, if I have a vector that's you know any vector at time equals zero. So any vector, right? Then this vector is going to be sort of transported by this equation. Okay. So let's call it x1 and x x1, right? So this is going to be x1 of t. This is going to obey this equation, right? This variation equation is going to have the derivative. I mean, this is going to be matrix depending on t. And you just take the derivative. You just say that the derivative of this vector equals that matrix times the vector itself. Okay, so it's a linear equation. It's a linear system, excuse me. It's a linear system, but it's t-dependent. It's time-dependent. Okay. What if you have a second linearly independent solution, x2, then that's going to have, that's, that's the initial condition, and that's going to be the, um, the solution at time t, right? So what's the determinant between this determinant of this metric solution? So x tilde is going to be consisting simply of x1 and x2. Put, it, put on columns, right? So you put this on columns, it's going to be the metric solution of this differential equation. So the determinant is going to be basically the determinant of these two columns, right? Of the matrix consisting of these two columns. The point is that the determinant of this is independent of the uh, basis x1, x2. And again, this is something I mentioned before, but so in other words, if you change the basis, how is the metrics going to change? How is the metrics uh, solution going to change? It's going to be similar to, to the one with, with a different basis. So if I have um, so if I have x and x prime, well prime is from derivative, I don't want to do x prime, but let's say x and y prime, x, x tilde and y tilde, they're going to be similar similar matrices, what does similar matrices mean?
there is a matrix, invertible matrix T such that X tilde is T inverse Y T. So when you take the determinant, you'll see that the determinant of the X tilde is the same as the determinant of Y tilde. So in that sense, it's independent of the basis. Okay. And, and because it's independent of the basis, pretty much of R2. I mean, it's, it's R2. Let's choose a basis for R2 that's given by the following. Let's take this vector y and the vector not y, excuse me, not y f of y and v okay v being the orthogonal so here's here's f of y so this is y this is f of y and v is orthogonal to it so it's, it's the direction of the local section so just take this basis and 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 let this evolve according to the variation equation okay and let's see what the determinant of of that uh, matrix is going to be. Okay. So the first one. The first statement is the following: is that this solution. Uh, X tilde at capital T in the direction of, of Y F of Y I'm sorry this is this is really capital F of Y I'm sorry this is this is just the right hand side so that's the, the direction of the field The first claim is that when you go around your solution and you take the initial the initial vector to be tangent to this to this to the periodic solution, okay. Then when you come back to the uh, to y because it's a periodic solution, it's going to have the same value. So it's going to be the same thing. Well, let me put the other one too, and then then, then see see if it's uh... so. The other one is x tilde Remember, this is a matrix, right? So x tilde of, of capital T is a matrix. So this is applied to a vector, and it gives a vector. And x tilde of capital T and And V is going to be the following. This is going to be the Poincare map. So that's where the relation comes from. Poincare map at Y times V minus the partial of T. That's the period. That's the period. I'll tell you in a second what it is, what it is. Uh, with respect to S at Y f of y, okay? Looks up, look, looks messy, but this... Let me just convince, convince yourself that these two relations, once established, tell you that the uh, determinant of, of x tilde is, is the same as the... Um, as this b prime. Okay, so why is that? So this basically says that x tilde 
of T, of capital T, uh, is similar to the following metrics. The metrics basically So basically, how do you write this in this basis, V and F of Y? Well, how do you write a Lin transformation, a matrix, in a different basis? You take the value of this transformation on one of the vectors. So it's going to be 1 and 0, and you put them on columns. So it's going to be 1 and 0. And then the same with the second vector. So the second vector is V. So this is going to be this coefficient minus partial of t with respect to s at y and p prime of v. So it means the determinant of x tilde at capital T is the same as the determinant of this matrix, which is obviously p prime of y. This product minus that product, so this is zero. So this is just p prime of one. Okay, so this this makes the connection between the derivative of the Poincaré map and the determinant of that two by two solu metric solution. Uh, let's see. So what is? How can we see the the two there? I'm going to refer back to the to the um, Well, let's look at the first one. First one. So, um, proof of claim x of t f of y is f of y. So, the first statement I think should be um, somewhat easy. The second one is probably less, but Here's here's the first one. Okay, so um, take the function, take the solution that starts. So that's that's exactly the periodic solution, right? Is is the flow starting at y as a function at t equals zero, and then as a function of t, right? So take the derivative with respect to t. What's the derivative with respect to t of this? <coughs> well, it's actually exactly the same as x tilde at t Apply to that. Uh, apply to this as an initial condition. So this is this is at y. Y is I mean f of y is the derivative at at y, right? So this is later here is phi of t and y, right? And the claim is that the
the direction of well the derivative of this with respect to time right it's the same as the derivative with respect to time of this so this just this vector right is the same as the uh, map of this two by two matrix applied to this vector here okay so that maybe maybe I should have said it a little bit more carefully here is that so the derivative of phi of t and this this is just f at phi of t right because because phi is, is a flaw right so I guess now the question is if you take the derivative of this So take the derivative of this one more time, right? Then this is going to be basically the just like the chain rule, right? Is the is the df at phi of t and y times the derivative dt phi of t and y, right? So this guy differentiated equals the same as df of phi of t and y times itself, right? So it basically says that give this a different name. I mean, I, I don't want to call it, um, let's say, psi of t, right? So then I have psi prime equals df of phi of t and y times psi. Okay. So this and at time zero equals the derivative. It's just f at y, right? Right. At time zero, the derivative is just f at y. Okay, so you have this psi function, which solves the variational equation with this initial condition. Right, so this basically says that psi is the same as this solution at applied to f of y. Okay. I think we did this computation when we talk about variational equation. It's sort of taking another derivative. So how can how how does this thing imply what I wrote there on top? All we have to do now is to say, well, when little t is capital T, this actual solution comes back where it was, right? So the this this x tilde actually takes this vector and always moves it to one where which is the derivative of that vector of that of that solution, right? So it always stays in that vector field, sort of direction field, right? So it takes this vector and it moves it that, that direction, that direction, that direction, that direction. So by the time it comes back, it's in the direction of f of y. It is f of y. So that's all that is the same, right? That x tilde just moves it tra tangent to the solution and it comes back and there's, there's, you know, there it is, right? It's back to that thing. It makes sense. At least intuitively, I mean, this, as I said, this this really t t is about a, sort of transporting a vector along along a, a solution, okay? And what is saying this: the tangent vector gets transported into the tangent vector at any other point, okay? By this by this linear, you know, by this uh, by this x tilde, which is 
linear, non non uh, non autonomous system. Okay. So that I said that's kind of the easy one, the easy one. So so how about this the other, this other one here? Well, what's this T and what is what is S? S is sort of the direction in the in the local section direction. And what could T mean? Well, what T really means is obviously there's only one T that kind of makes the pre period of this, right? But now you can say the following, you can say that on the local section I start at some t equals zero and I go and the next time I hit the local section, let's call it it's not a period, but it's a it's it's um it's going to be like, you know, it's going to be approximately equal to t, right? So in fact, for the second equation in the, in the claim, here's, here's how you proceed, and I'll just, I'll just write it down, and then I'll say that the Poincaré map of some point on the section, so you agree that this is a point on the section? Because this is y and this is v, so it's just y plus sv. Okay? That's the parameterization of the local section. So the Poincare of this is going to be another point on the is going to be another point, right? I mean if this is this, this is P of Y and S. Okay, so this goes this way and then this comes this way. Okay, so this is just the flow. And here's the T of Y plus T S, uh, plus, uh, plus S V, and Y plus S V. Okay. So all this is saying this is the time of return. To the local to the to, to the local section. Okay, this is the time, and, and it depends on s. It depends on it depends on s. It's a function of s. Okay. So I, I said nothing nothing fancy. I just said that the Poincaré map is the point is is the point on the f is the yeah. So is the solution of the uh, flow at this time, the time when it first hits the local section again. Okay. So now let's take the derivative with respect to uh, derivative with respect to s and then s equal and then set s equal zero of this. And this is just v prime p prime of y times v, right? Just a chain rule. B prime of y. It's just a, this is just a function of, of s. It's just a function of s. It's one variable. So it's just p prime times v. Okay. And the other one is on the right hand side. Is what is is um, the derivative of phi with respect to To time. What's the derivative of phi with respect to time? It's phi prime, right? Phi prime is just f at this expression, so it's f at y times the derivative partial of t with respect to s plus the derivative of phi with respect to y times the derivative of s with respect to s, so that's v, right? So it's, what's the derivative of phi with respect to, okay, the derivative of phi with respect to y, let's write like this, derivative phi with respect to y times v, excuse me, times v, okay? 
and derivative of phi with respect to y turns out to be the same as x at um, x. Let's see, is it the same as the one above there? Yeah, so it's x times v is p prime minus that, so it's, so this is x at capital T, okay? So we just got the other uh, relation that p prime of v times y equals that, okay? So this basically means that x, x of t time, uh, times v is the same as p prime of y, v minus f of y, dt ds as s equals zero. Okay, so you know that's kind of it's kind of difficult to um, to come up with these things because with these computations because um, they're objects that you don't really see. I mean, you don't really see that this two by two matrix that acts on a vector and moves it along the curve is is something that um, in two dimensions is, is, is more difficult to visualize um, but let me let me just maybe take you out of this mode of um, of working with things you don't see and just do a, do a quick example here um, let's take this function this uh, excuse me this um, dynamical system in polar coordinates so it's it's one that we know already a lot of about it we know that r equals 1 is a periodic solution right 0 so it goes like this And we also know that if R is less than 1, then R prime is positive, right? So it's going, well, theta prime is 1 means it's always counterclockwise, right? So it means it's going this way. And if R is greater than 1, then it's R prime is negative, right? So R prime is negative. Outside the the, inter the the limit cycle, and R prime is positive inside. So obviously, it's looks like it's orbitally stable, right? Or asymptotically stable. And in this case, you can you can again explicitly find the R. So it's not maybe it's not. Uh, such a conclusive example, but I just want to show you that that um, the computation of that integral from zero to t of of this expression along the curve will indeed uh, yield what sign? Positive or negative? Because because the derivative of the Poincaré map is the exponential of this number, right? So this number has to be to be asymptotically stable. It has to be negative, right? Because the exponential to exponentiate, I mean, to get something less than one, you have to have the exponential of something less than zero. Okay? So again this would imply P prime of you know P prime, let's just leave it P prime is EXP of this integral is going to be less than one. Okay. So why is this so so notice that 
this combination is much, I mean, what does this integral involve? Well, it involves knowing the periodic solution, right? And knowing basically the div divergence of the vector field, of the direction field, on the periodic solution, nothing else. Okay? So, uh, it doesn't involve computation of the, of the uh, Poincare map or anything explicitly. Okay? So, we know the periodic solution is, is, you know, when the radius is 1, so it's a circle. And what is the, what is the divergence? Well, what is f and g? Well, f and g are hidden. You don't see the f. f is supposed to be the right-hand side of x prime, right? And uh, g is the right-hand side of y prime. But you don't have that. So does anybody know how to basically write the divergence in polar coordinates? So you see, I have a vector field that's like this, right? Well, divergence indeed is partial of f with respect to x plus partial of g with respect to y. But what if what if the vector field is given in polar coordinates? Nobody. Uh, I'd like to just say it's 1 over r times f plus partial of g with respect to theta. I think I checked that. Let me, let me just... Is there any quick way to verify this? Huh? Uh, basically, the question is what is the partial with respect to x, right? It's partial with respect to r, partial r with respect to x, and partial, with partial of r with respect to y. I'm sorry, partial of theta with respect to x, uh, partial with respect to theta, right? And partial respect to y. Well, I think I think I've checked that, and, and let's see. Um, how do you verify this really quick? So, partial with respect to x and partial with respect to y is basically the Jacobian. It is two by two metrics, right? So 
partial with respect to r and partial with respect to theta, it's going to be the inverse of this with respect to x with this with respect to y. So this is partial of x with respect to r, partial of x with respect to theta. Maybe uh, y with respect to r. Let's put it y with respect to r. Partial of x with respect to theta, partial of y with respect to theta. Y with respect to theta, so it's cosine theta. Sine theta minus r sine theta or cosine theta. Gosh, um, I, well, I'm, okay, I'm pretty sure, I mean, I'm, I'm, let, let's just, let's just use that and see if, if we get the, um, the expression, but I, I think, I think this is right, um, but I'll, I'll double check that, um, because, because basically you just have to, com to compare this, you know, this operator with, um, what comes in terms of R and theta, so. Let's see, 1 over R. Okay, let's see, what, what is the derivative with respect to R of F if, if I'm looking at this example? So F of R and theta is R1 minus R squared. So it's R minus R cubed, right? So partial of f with respect to r is 1 minus 3 r squared, right? So what is partial of f with respect to r plus 1 over r f plus partial of g with respect to theta? Well, this guy is 0, right? And this is 1 minus 3 r squared plus 1 minus r squared, right? Because that's... 1 over r f of r, uh, 1 over r, 1 over r times f. So this is 2 minus 4 r squared. Okay? So this thing, is negative when r equals 1, right? So you're integrating something that's negative over, I don't know, period 2 pi, it doesn't matter. But the thing is the div this divergence is actually be it's actually negative, right? O along that curve. Okay? Now along other curves it might not be um, you know, it might change sign. Right? Closer to zero it's actually positive, the divergence is positive. But along R equals one, this is 2 minus 4, so that's that's uh, negative, right? So it means along this uh, periodic solution, the Poincaré map is is has derivative less than one, so that that's asymptotic stability. Okay. Okay, so that's how that's that's used um, that formula, I guess. Um, unfortunately, that's not so easy for Van der Poel equation. Uh, for Van der Poel equation, which I mentioned last time, let's see if I listed it here. Yeah, this one here. So, okay, this is not in polar coordinates, so it should be very easy to uh, to see. What's the derivative? What's the divergence of this vector field? It's partial of this with respect to 
x, so it's 1 minus x squared plus partial this is back to y, 0, right? So it's just 1 minus x squared. Is the exponential of this integral. Question is, in the, in the cycle, it's some, somewhat like this, right? So it's not round. It has. Um, question is, along this curve, along this uh, curve, is this expression always positive or always negative? Well, turns out that this. Uh, cycle goes, you know, above and below one and negative one. So you see, when x is between negative one and one, this thing is positive. Isn't that three x squared? Three x squared. Yeah, three x squared. You mean the, the, this picture? No, the, uh, is it 1 minus 3x squared minus 1? No, because this is the derivative with respect to y. Yeah. So, okay, so the point is that this, um, this quantity is not always positive or not always negative along the solution. In fact, you know, I don't know exactly what the bonds are for x here, but Okay, now this is 1 over the square root of 3. So, bottom line is that on, on two portions of your, of your solution, this divergence is positive. And on other two portions, divergence is negative. Okay? Question is, I mean, how do you... Uh, You know, how do you sum them up to get information about the stability of that equilibrium? Okay. So that requires actually an additional um, well, it basically is, it requires additional analysis to um, so it turns out that the parts that are negative have a bigger contribution than the parts that are positive. Turns out uh, that that um, this integral ends up being positive. Uh, excuse me, negative. Okay, which means that uh, p prime is still less than one, meaning that gamma is asymptotically stable. But that's not just an immediate consequence of of this formula, okay. So sometimes, you know, that formula can t can tell you the whole story about the solution, the periodic solution, but other times it doesn't, okay. All right. So let me um, go back and hopefully um, at least kind of cover the idea of, of this. So back to the question: um, When do we have periodic solutions? Okay. Original problem uh, that when do we um, have a limit cycle? That is a periodic solution that is in the omega limit set of, of a point. So the Poincare Bendixson. says the following is that if if the omega limit set of a point of a dynamical system 
of a planar dynamic system. So this is x prime equals f of x in the plane. So if the omega limit set of a point is non-empty, closed, and bounded, and contains no equilibrium, Point, then it is a limit cycle. So there are two things to this uh, theorem. It says if I start at some at some point and I kind of wander in the plane, but it has I have some sort of a limit. Okay, and we don't know that this limit is a, is a limit cycle, so but we just know it has some limit points, right? So if this is the case, then so part one is to say the following: is that if I start inside of this omega limit set. To show that uh, y is part of a periodic solution and part two is that is that uh, omega the omega limit set itself so this whole, this whole set is is itself a periodic solution, a periodic orbit. Okay, so this this are two. This I mean this are sort of the first one is weaker than the second one, right? The second one is the conclusion of the of the theorem. It says the omega limit set is is itself a periodic orbit. Okay, but the first one to to kind of uh, an easier way an easier thing to prove first is this: if I start with a point y that is in the omega limit set of this x naught, right? So I know that y is visited infinitely often and infinitely closed. Okay. Then basically say that this itself is a periodic solution. That, that it, it lies on a periodic solution. Okay. It doesn't say that there could be other points somewhere else. Of course, there could be other points uh, in the omega limit set of x naught, right? So this first part is a little bit more uh, is weak is a weaker statement. So just just an, uh, uh, an idea of the proof is. to use this local sections, okay, local sections that we talked about. So if I have, take a point y, which is visited by this solution starting at x naught infinitely often, right? And now let's take, let's say this is the direction field, or the direction that the solution at, at y not, at y is, has to take, right? y is not an equilibrium because we said that it doesn't have an equilibrium. So it, it has a non-zero magnitude, and so it has a direction, right? So it means that the solution itself goes tangent to that, right? So because of that, you can construct a local section. Okay? In the local section, what happens? In the local section you have, the picture looks somewhat standard, right? It looks like you can parameterize this local section so the solution through each of these points you know extends and actually doesn't uh, well doesn't intersect each other and you can create this region this neighborhood of the point that is conjugate to just a rectangle right 
That's what we talked about last time. Okay, so now let's see why. How do we conclude that that actually the solution that starts here eventually has to come back the same place? Because that's what we want to show, right? We want to show that the, the, the solution starting at y, you know, wanders, but then it has to come back at y. Well, that's what we have to show. Here, I just I just extended it like back and back and forth. I mean, uh, back in time and forward in time. But one has to kind of make the conclusion that it's. Um, you see, I mean, we have to use the fact that y is visited by that solution starting at x naught infinitely often. So you. You know, why not y starts why not is is some any solution, right? That kind of gets as close as you want to y, right? So eventually the solution starting at x naught is gonna enter this box. It's gonna have to enter this box infinitely often, right? When it enters this box infinitely often, let's say it's it has to hit the, the local section, okay? Because if it's in the box, it's going to hit the local section. So you see, you can actually track the solution x x naught, the solution starting at x naught, by its by its hits on this local section. So let's say at some point it, it hits it hits it at, at at this location, right? I mean, we know it has to hit that box, right? It has to be in the box. Right. So it means n is a low, uh, flow box near y. That's a neighborhood of y. So now that it means that um, there exists x t n, which is the flow starting at x naught with times t n in this in this neighborhood, right? As t n goes to infinity, has to has to be closer and closer to that point, right? So. We can assume this to be on the so we're going to assume can ass can assume belongs to this local section S. So what's the conclusion? Think about two consecutive hits of this. So I start, you know, there's a TN, there's a solution XTN that, that hits that box, right? That the local section, and then it keeps going. Right? 
keeps going, but eventually the next Tn plus 1 is going to be also in that, in that box, right? So what happens is you're going to have that sort of uh, excursions. So starting with this point, it's going to be, so this is at Tn, so let me, let me do another picture here. So I'm going to have x of Tn. It's going to do something and then come back, and this is x of Tn plus 1. Okay? This is where y is. Okay? So what happens? is every time, the next time that's going to happen is xtn plus 1 is going to wander somewhere and then come back, it's going to hit that box, right? It could be, well we don't know exactly where it is, but it's, we know that that sequence is actually approaching y, okay? We know the sequence is approaching y. So what happens is, if you start at y by continuity, right, the value, and, and you keep wondering after some time, what's going to happen is you're going to have to be in the neighborhood of this sequence, right? So you're going to you, you cannot wonder you cannot be away from this, okay? Because then you won't, you wouldn't have the sort of the continuity property of the flow, so you cannot be away from y. So that's kind of, I mean it's a little bit uh, vague, but it's saying that the solution starting at y has to come back at y. It cannot come back away from y because because these solutions will have to come back closer and closer to y. Okay? So since basically the flow at Tn plus 1 Um, which is x of tn plus 1 converges to y, it means that the flow starting at y uh, has to converge to y. Um, well, it did not convert, but has to hit the local section S. Has to hit the local section local section at Y, meaning that at some for some T. So it means phi of T Y has to be equal to Y for some T, and that's. I'm saying that y is on a periodic solution. Okay, so that's that's sort of the first step in proving this theorem is that um, any point and any limit point for any solution in the, pl in the plane has to be uh, on a periodic solution. The the, the other thing which I uh, won't have time to talk about now, but it says um, that there's only one periodic solution. It cannot be two, or it cannot be uh, it cannot be an omega limit set that consists of. So part two, I'll just draw the picture, and that's it. It cannot be that I have this and I have this. This cannot constitute. an omega limit set for a point, okay? Because you're in the plane and you cannot, if the point is outside, it's ne never going to be able to reach the inside one, right? If it's inside, is, is it has to go either to the inside or to the outside, and that has to do with the Poincaré map being monotone, like increasing or decreasing. Also, you cannot have two separate periodic solutions that are uh, in the omega limit set of a point because if you're approaching one you cannot approach the other one right you'd have to kind of go between the two and that means that you would have some additional points okay so anyway that's not a proof but uh, sort of a 
illustration of why only one periodic solution is in the omega limit set. Okay. Uh, what's the home? Okay, I'll post the homework on the website. Um, I think I just have three problems: six, seven, and nine. So let me just put it here. So homework: six, seven, and nine on chapter ten. And I'll do it for next Wednesday. So.